Robert Ballard is a professor of oceanography at the University of Rhode Island. He goes around and speaks to people all around the country, really all around the world, uh, about what is under the ocean. I look at some of uh, the pictures that uh, he has. Um, okay, so this is what the uh, ocean floor looks like if you took away the water. So, uh, you know, pretty similar to looking at our globe. Um, so this is the uh, uh, Great uh, Rift. Uh, this is their, their submarine. They go down in. They have powerful lights because it's pitch black down there. And uh, so that's how they're able to see things. Uh, this is, uh, these are two uh, large chimneys. Uh, they measure it at 650 degrees uh, at the exit, uh, hot enough to melt lead. There's some more uh, chimneys. This is a commercial grade copper, lead, zinc, silver, and gold. You can get rich going down there. Uh, they find all kinds of interesting life. These are 10-foot-long uh, tube worms. Pretty amazing. So they found huge clam beds down there. Looks like that guy's eating a couple of them. <clears throat> So this is some of the life forms they find down there. Even though it's inky black, uh, they have figured out how to you know, duplicate photosynthesis down there. Pretty amazing. Uh, they find a lot of interesting creatures that we don't see here above the water. There's one. Uh, these are some rock formations. Pretty astounding, huh? Uh, they found uh, 10,000 uh, volcanoes under the water, and this one is producing methane gas, not lava like we see on volcanoes on the earth, and uh, uh, we don't have any of those above ground. So anyway, those are just some of those. Uh, so Ballard asks, why are we ignoring the oceans? The... Uh, uh, NASA's budget for the year would fund the oceanography uh, atmosphere budget for 1,600 years. 50% of the United States is underwater. Uh, that's be along the Alaska coast, west coast, east coast, and Gulf Coast. 72% uh, of our planet is underwater. Uh, and then uh, this picture of a young girl... She's still up there? Yeah. So she's not watching a basketball game. She's not at a concert. Uh, she's watching one of uh, Ballard's uh, presentations, and just her jaw drops when she understands what she is looking at. What we don't know about what's under the sea is similar to what we don't know about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the least talked about member of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And today in our series, Christian Power 201, I want to talk about the Holy Spirit. Turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 8. If you want to use our Bibles under the seats, it's on page 1,132. So in Romans 1 to 3, the Apostle Paul talks about that we can all know there's a God, but we turn our backs on him, and we mess up our lives, mess up our world. We fall short of the glory of God. In chapters 4 and 5, he talks about God's grace. He sent his son to die for our sins so we can be forgiven and have a restored relationship with God. We have peace with God through Jesus Christ our Lord. In chapter 6, he talks about uh, new life in Christ. If we give our lives to Christ, we are buried with Christ in baptism symbolically, uh, and we can put to death the old life and experience new life. Then in chapter 7, Apostle Paul says, what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do. What a wretched man I am who will rescue me from this body of death. The power of the Holy Spirit is the answer to Paul's cry. 
What Paul describes in Romans 7 is the attempt to live as a Christian without the power of the Holy Spirit. It can't be done. So in chapter 8, Paul tells us how we can live as a follower of Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. We can't be saved on our own efforts, and we can't live as a Christian on our own efforts. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. If you're not a believer, you chose a great week to attend because you will see today what your life would look like if you gave your life to Christ. The Holy Spirit is essential to living as a Christian. Depending on the Holy Spirit is essential to every one of us. Whether you're a teenager, young single, married, divorced, widowed, retired, You have to know about the Holy Spirit. Uh, Parents, you need to talk to your children about the Holy Spirit. Uh, Your child cannot succeed in school or at school without the power of the Holy Spirit. Paul shares three ministries of the Holy Spirit. One, the Holy Spirit empowers us to live as Christians. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The Holy Spirit assures us that we're forgiven. We're not condemned by God. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit, who gives life, has set you free from the law of sin and death. Uh, the The Holy Spirit sets us free from being justified by the law and from trying to be sanctified by the law. Uh, because we have the Holy Spirit, we have power in us. We don't have to fall to sin every time. Why would we want to go back to the old way of living? That makes no sense. God gave us the Holy Spirit so we could lead new lives. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. Uh, The Greek word for flesh is sarx. It doesn't refer to the flesh that covers our bones and ligaments, but to the human nature apart from God. And so he condemns sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us, who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. There's the key. We can't become a Christian in the flesh. We can't live as a Christian in the flesh. We have to live by the power of the Holy Spirit. When I was in high school, I had trouble reading the blackboard in school. I didn't think much about it because I figured everybody else couldn't see it either. Then I learned that other kids could see it just fine. So I went to the doctor He said, you have nearsightedness. You can't see in a distance. So he introduced me to a new power, the power of contact lenses. With the contact lenses on, I can see fine. See perfectly well. It didn't take away my myopia. I still had, when I don't wear my contacts, I still can't see. But when I put the contacts on, I see just fine. When the Holy Spirit comes into our lives, he overcomes our sin nature. He doesn't do away with it. It's still there. But if we depend on his power, we don't have to fall to every temptation. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The Holy Spirit helps us set our minds on the way God thinks. So we can think differently. That's why we feel it's so important that you spend time between Sundays reading the Bible or using our journal or some other uh, journal. Um, It gives you a chance to, to hear from God and to begin to think the way God thinks. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The reason we're willing to let the Holy Spirit change the way we think is because that leads to the best life, a life that's filled with peace and real life. It's a good life. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. Uh, Paul thwarts uh, the idea that you can have Christ and not have the Holy Spirit. When you commit your life to Christ, the Holy Spirit comes in. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. 
And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. When you become a Christian, you receive the Holy Spirit. This is the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. The same power that God used when he raised Christ from the dead now lives in you. You have that much power. You don't have to fall every time you're faced with an opportunity to sin. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. The Holy Spirit helps us put to death the misdeeds of the body. Uh, This is Paul's argument. Because the Holy Spirit lives in you, why would we want to go back to living according to the flesh? That way leads to death. The Holy Spirit leads to life. We're alive. We have new power. In 2004, Austin was a sixth grader, just a normal kid, a little goofy. God got a hold of his heart and mind that year when he learned that 2,452 children are orphaned every day by their parents dying of HIV AIDS. And so he decided he could do something about it. And so he determined to shoot 2,452 free throws. And uh, he raised $3,000 for orphans. The next year, other kids around the country heard of his effort. He called it uh, Hoops for Hope. And uh, they raised $85,000. But the story gets better. Uh, he, he built uh, a school in Zambia. So this is a, little, this is a middle schooler. Builds a school in Africa, and he decides he's going to build a health clinic next to it. So the next year, he raised two hundred and eleven thousand dollars with helps of uh, students all across the country. CBS decided to interview him at the NCAA Final Four. So at halftime, Ashley Judge interviews him and tells what you're doing. Then she asks, "Why are you doing this?" Normal question. And so he shared about his faith in Jesus Christ. A six-minute interview, he had a chance to share in a national audience on TV about his faith in Christ. Austin was so excited about what he was doing that it just naturally led Ashley to ask him, well, why? And so he explained his faith in Christ. We can live a life of following Christ in such a way that it demands an explanation. People will say, why are you different? Why do you do what you do? It's because we have the power of the Holy Spirit. Two, the Holy Spirit assures us that we are God's children. One of the important ministries of the Holy Spirit is to assure us that we have become part of God's family. We're in, we're his children. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. Uh, The Holy Spirit assures us that we've been adopted into God's family. Uh, Now, because we're his children, we want to live in a way that represents his family well. And so we want to listen to his promptings. Maybe you've heard the, felt the Holy Spirit prompting you. You're going about your day and you sense him saying, talk to this person. Maybe you don't even know this person. Or stop what you're doing. Go help your husband or your wife or your son or daughter. Or, you know, family member or friend out of town. You get the sense, call him. It turns out there's something going on and you can encourage. Or you get a sense, you know, somebody says something mean to you and you're going to shoot back at them and says, bite your tongue. Don't do it. Walk away. This is the Holy Spirit inside of us. We all want to learn uh, to hear his voice. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. We live in fearless intimacy with God. Rather, the spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. Abba is the word Jesus taught us that we're supposed to call God. It's the most intimate word for God, Daddy. 
The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Jory and I have four biological children and five adopted children. Jory has also helped over a thousand families adopt uh, through her ministry. Our children, biological and adopted, are all the same. They're all loved by us. They all love us. We're all one big family. The Spirit assures us that we have been adopted into God's family. He's our Father. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. The Holy Spirit assures us that we are uh, heirs, that someday when we die, we will receive a resurrection body. We'll go to live with Christ in heaven. The Holy Spirit empowers us to live as Christians. The Holy Spirit assures us that we are God's children. And three, the Holy Spirit strengthens us in our sufferings. In verse 17, the Apostle Paul surprises us. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. He surprises us by telling us that suffering leads to glory. Notice that last line. If indeed we share in his sufferings. Becoming a Christian does not remove you from the real world. He doesn't take, you, uh, take your problems away. He doesn't say there'll be no suffering. That's not the promise of being a Christian. The promise is, is that he gives you his power to help you through it. The power of the Holy Spirit helps you in your sufferings. One of the greatest writers of the 20th century was Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who wrote one day in the life of Ivan Denisovich. It's his autobiographical account of one day in a Russian prison camp. So this is a typical day. We, we uh, estimate that 30 million people under Joseph Stalin lost their lives in Russian, uh, the Russian gulag. Uh, at the end of the day, Ivan uh, smokes a cigarette on his barrack. He managed to s- smuggle it in and and uh, he smokes it. When he gets down to the last puff, he blows it out. And it's kind of an audible sigh of thanks to God for getting him through the day. Well, Losha is in the bunk next to him. And he's the one that leads him to Christ. And uh, disciples him as a follower of Christ. And he says, Ivan, your soul is begging to pray. Why don't you give it its freedom? And Ivan replies, why should I? Your prayers don't do you any good. Every prayer you offered comes back marked rejected. You Christians don't fare any better than anybody else. You get 25 years just like everybody else. What good has it done you? And Elosha says, I don't pray that way. I pray for God to help me do right, right here in this prison camp. Not to get me out of the prison. So then Ivan, this is Alexander Solzhenitsyn, this is his autobiography. He blows one last puff of smoke in Elosha's face. It's kind of a a gesture of affection. It's like he's saying, you're getting through to me. Elosha's faith doesn't lift him out of the prison camp. He doesn't rise above it, uh, above everybody else. God gives him the Holy Spirit to help him live where he is and to make it in the real world. The Holy Spirit assures us that God loves us so much that he gives us a, a future of full redemption. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Apostle Paul says, our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the future glory that we'll receive. Our present sufferings are temporary. Our future glory will be eternal. If you know you have a wonderful two-week vacation coming up, you can make it through one long workday, right? And that's Paul's point. He says, our suffering is short. Keep your eyes on the glory. 
Paul wants us to see that suffering is not just something that happens to humans, but it is for all creation. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. This is an amazing sentence. He says, the children of God have of rule, have dominion over the earth to preserve the created order. The whole created order, like we just saw, of what's going on under the ocean, waits for Christ's return. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Creation is looking forward to Christ's return. Sin has affected creation as well as humans. Poisonous bugs, disease, natural disasters, these weren't part of God's original creation. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. He says the whole created order, human beings as well as natural a creation, groans for the redemption of the world. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. This is a great verse. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with wordless groans. In the midst of our troubles, the Holy Spirit intercedes for us. Spirits helps us in our prayers. We don't know how to pray sometimes what we ought to pray. The Spirit is praying for us. This was important for me to understand when I realized that God wants my best even more than I do. He loves me so much, and I don't even know what's best for me. And His Spirit is interceding for me. God knows your needs. He knows you want to be married. He knows you want to have a baby. He knows your need for a better job or more fulfilling job. He knows you need a friend. He knows you want ministry where you something you feel like I were you were born for. And the Spirit is interceding for you. And what does the Spirit pray? And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. He prays for God's will, God's best for us. The end of my junior year in college, I was frustrated. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I was a psychology major, but I was pretty sure I didn't want to be a counselor. To sit for eight hours a day and listen to people's problems, that would be torture for me. And um, when I I get together with family, uh, my dad is one of uh, nine siblings and my mom's one of five siblings. So I I have all these aunts and uncles and they say, hey, Ron, what are you going to do? Such a frustrating question because I had no clue. Well, my senior year, I decided... I think I'll be a pastor. And so I applied to a Trinity University, a seminary in Chicago. I was accepted. I applied to another seminary, and they lost my application. So it made it kind of easy to decide which one to attend. I applied to Young Life in Chicago, and they were very excited about me coming, and they would call me every week. Are you, have you decided? Are you coming? We'll pay you. Name your price. I say, okay, a million dollars a week. And I applied to Young Life at where the other seminary was. They couldn't care less if I came. Didn't matter to them. So I went to Chicago. My girlfriend broke up with me. The idea of her becoming a pastor's wife was like really weird. (laughs) She thought I was becoming strange. She didn't want it. I think the biggest payoff, I know the biggest payoff for me was in Chicago, I met Jory. She has been an amazing wife. People come to me and they say, Paul, I want to be married. Will God ever bring a Christian guy into my life? 
will he ever bring me a Christian girl? I say, yeah, he can do that. If God can take me from San Francisco, where I lived, up to Portland, and then back to Chicago to meet Jory, he can do the same for you. The Holy Spirit is interceding for you, for your deepest needs, your best good. The Holy Spirit is essential to living as a Christian. Like Paul, I feel like crying out, what a wretched man I am. Who will deliver me from this body that is subject to death? The answer is Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. I want my life to bring honor to Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. I want to experience spirit-filled living. I want to attempt things that are so big, so out of the box, that when I do them, people will say, Ron, that's amazing. That's way more than you could have done. Only God could have done that. Would you pray with me? Lord God, thank you that you not only sent your son to die for us, but you send your Holy Spirit to live inside of us, God in us. The same power that you used when you raised Christ from the dead, the Holy Spirit now lives in us if we've committed our lives to you. We have that much power. If you want to pray right now, I want to invite you to, every head bowed, say, I want to live by the power of the Holy Spirit. I don't want to have to fall to sin every time. I want to depend on Your power, God, help me to do that and listen to your promptings this week. If you've never committed your life to Christ so that you have the Holy Spirit inside of you, you can do it right now. I'll give you all a minute to pray. Lord God, we thank you that you've given us your power to live within us. You don't take away our sin nature. You don't take away our problems, our sufferings. Life is tough. But we have power. We have more power, more than enough to meet every need we have. Thank you. Now, Father, we're going to receive our offering. It's one way we can show you how much you mean to us, giving our gifts, take our gifts, help multiply them to be used in this area, that we can meet, reach many people in Portland. And we pray for our teenagers and our children in our church. Lead them to you, to your son, Jesus Christ. May they grow in their faith so that when they go to school, they know that your spirit is within them, helping them deal with whatever they face. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.